those of you who are already here, you should have one of uh, these little red and green paddles. Can I see those paddles? Everybody's got a paddle? Yeah, cool. Thank you, thank you. Um, every time you want to agree with something someone is saying on stage today, or you want to say yes, or you want to show encouragement, or whatever it is, flash the green side, okay? And every time you disagree, or you want to say no, or it's also something that maybe they say something that just really you know, riles you up, or that you, you get really frustrated about as well, show the red side. And if you have trouble with color, just twirl it around. We love the enthusiasm one way or another. And now, finally, before I introduce everyone, we will have a curated Twitter feed on display throughout the session popping up here. Uh, so if you would like uh, to participate, please be sure to use the hashtag PassTheMic and the hashtag Age2018. Our team will sort through the hundreds of tweets and we will show the best on the screen. So please make sure to engage. Uh, and here we go. Everyone, please welcome to the stage our youth participants. We've got D coming up. <laughs> Come on, let's get around the fight. We've got D, Josephine, Baraka, Peter, Nancy, Daniel. Shinde, Bruna, Danny, Melody, and Zach. Woo! Yeah. That's great. And now, please also welcome our moderator, founder of the Charlize Theron Africa Outreach Project, Academy Award winning actress, and United Nations Messenger of Peace, Charlize Theron. A big round of applause. Hello, everybody! Wow, this is, I'm going to sound so old right now, this is about the coolest thing ever. Because like Quinn just said, this is a milestone. This is the first ever all-youth special session, session at an international AIDS conference ever! Not the last. Right, guys? All right, perfect. So, um, I am really honored to be your moderator today. I don't know how I got the gig, but I'm very happy to be here. I always feel like my kids think I'm kind of cool when I'm hanging out with young people, so thank you for that. I'm also not going to take up any time because we have limited time today, and I really want to give our panel uh, as much time as possible. So we're going to have a conversation about some issues facing HIV today and they're really going to take the lead. So the first thing I'm just going to start off is, you know, before we came here today, a large group of youth-led ne networks met this weekend at a youth pre-conference. And I know, Bruna, you were there. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what that experience was like? Thank you, Charlize. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm Bruna. I'm from Amsterdam Youth Force and Amsterdam Youth Force with White Plus we've organized the youth conference as you said with a lot of us here um, that were there gathering for this this large large meeting of uh, young young led organizations and it was uh, a very nice moment to actually convene before the conference and think about what meaningful participation means to us and what we want to achieve being here and from the next steps because we've seen that there's uh, a lot of challenges but uh, we were also very clear that we're very powerful, we're very strong, we're organized more than ever, and we have uh, many things on our side, like we have the power to reach our peers, we have, you know how to use technology on our favor, we have a lot of good uh, and so many strengths that we just you know, like wanna propel and, and put forward, and that was the moment that we convened and, and gathered and just uh, strategize how we're gonna do that from now on, and starting with this session right here. Amazing. You touched upon <clears throat> a little bit there, meaningful youth participation. And I was just wondering, for some of you, what does that mean? What does it mean to have meaningful youth participation? Sure. Well, uh, well uh, I guess it's about focusing on youth when you try to provide services for young people. So you always have to consider uh, young people's challenges and their fears and everything like relates to, to the service. So I heard during this conference that a lot of 
young person struggling, for example, with opening hours of uh, clinics because they they are open during the school, so um, they don't have even the possibility to to attend uh, to to to, do, to, do, uh, to go to a doctor. So um, you always should consider youth within services. Uh, you want to touch upon something? participation for me is uh, youth are the pillars of future and if we are not counting youth in any of the space which is provided and which is still available and it is I would just like to say it is nothing for us without us so youth should be involved in each and every platform if there is no platform we should create a platform that will empower you to build their capacity and to make them future leaders uh, for me, um, uh, as a young people, for me, the youth engagement is a fight, a literally fight, just by one reason. I am from Ukraine, and the Eastern Europe and Central Asian region is quite different from all the other uh, regions. And it's the only region that has failed the Millennium Goals, that has failed treatment coverage, all the services, and it's all failed. And we're sitting here and talking about the youth engagement, but at this time, the, those who are making decisions in our countries, they don't even know what is stigma and why should they talk to youth on HIV. So for me, teenagers, we became a part of national, for example, coordinating committee in Ukraine. But we literally fighted for that for two years. We fought for uh, engagement to the Global Fund to advocacy for money for the other teenagers. So for me, this is a fight. and. I just want to make it clear how it is in the, in countries of Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Thank you. It's great. We, we all realize and acknowledge that our, our struggle is different in, in different parts of the world. So thank you for sharing that. I have a question. If anybody feels uh, they want to touch upon this. Uh, how has your experience with HIV programs met or not met your needs? as young people. So I would be a little bit start with my introduction. I am Chinmay from India and I am born with HIV. So I am working with HIV since I was 9 years old. Uh, talking about my experience, uh, I have been struggling with uh, uh, with the services which, we, which were already available at, during the time I got detected. But slowly and gradually I got myself empowered. I started speaking about myself and I am not struggling anymore for getting all those services. But there are lots of youth, there are lots of adolescents and children who are still struggling a lot with their medicines. So I feel that HIV services is really important and uh, it should be given it should be made available for children who are, for youth who are still, uh, who needs to be built a bit like capacity. Zach? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Zach from Los Angeles and um, I didn't even experience or, uh, you know, come face to face with HIV services until I was 20 years old. And so all through high school I was closeted and, you know, dealing with sexuality and then I come to UCLA um, and luckily there I ran into a program called AMP, Arts Based Multiple Intervention Peer Education. And through through that program I was able to become empowered and learn about HIV. And my first partner uh, who I met off Craigslist when I was 19 was living with HIV and didn't tell me for six months. Um, so I my needs weren't met until I was a young adult. Um, and even in a place like California in Los Angeles where it's it's liberal and from the outside perspective it, it seems like there's like a lot of robust you know programming there there's there's still a lot of young people getting left behind um, and I really wanted to jump back to to the first question um, just because I, I, I feel like there are so many so many components to meaningful youth participation and in particular um, I think young people need to be in a decision-making capacity and not just in an advisory role um, I think young people need to have access to independent resources to implement our own programs and projects. I think young people... I also think young people should be able to hold veto powers on youth-oriented projects proposed by non-youth program creators. I'm thankful that this panel is really diverse. Oftentimes, 
there's like one or two young people who get to sit on a stage or at a panel or, or in a discussion just to meet a quota and it's very tokenistic and that also needs to change. Um, and one of my last points for that first question that I want to bring up is that young people need to be promoted to director level positions and given more salary based options and not just hourly. So I, I notice a lot of green paddles. Let me see, how do, are you guys agreeing with all of that? Well, that's across the board, as my friend says, yes! I know, I'm cool, I told you guys. So in listening to you all, and I was sitting in the green room watching some of the slides, I don't know, did you guys see some of the slides that were on the screen before? Well, you guys saw some of them, right? So there's a general feeling that comes across for me that HIV might not be considered uh, a primary concern anymore. And, and just from my personal experience of hearing young teenage girls talking about having a bigger fear of teenage pregnancy versus HIV, this is something I wanted to ask you guys. What, what are your opinions about that? Do you think it is enough of a concern within the young community? Yeah, go for it. Uh, so my name is Peter Diaz, I'm coming from uh, Malawi, and uh, I think right now young people are still, still, still a concern. So looking at, that's the reason why as young people we want to be involved in our program when it comes to HIV and this program. So apart from uh, being afraid of maybe any pregnancies, maybe other diseases like STIs, but I still feel like uh, young people are still having that feeling that we are, fear, we are afraid of uh, HIV. And that's the reason why today we are trying to add us that we should have that equal opportunity when it comes to programming around HIV and programs. Uh, maybe just to add again on the, the previous, the first question, uh, I feel like young person, young people, to be uh, participate, to be participating in the programming should all go to all the all the stages. So starting from maybe identifying a problem or identifying an opportunity uh, in programming, uh, designing the programs, we should all include it. Because as we always say, uh, there's nothing for us as the young people. If the young people are not involved. That means they're designing their own programs for us as the young people. So I feel like uh, the, the challenge is still there. We're still afraid of HIV, and that's the reason why we're crying out today that we should be involved in the HIV program. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, coming back to words of my colleague from Africa, my young colleague from Africa, I would like to say that actually, as I can see, in a lot of countries, even in African countries, the uh, situation with HIV is much more better, not in the statistics, but in the consideration of the problem. Because in African countries, I guess, the problem of HIV is a priority number one for healthcare. But if we look back to Ukraine, sorry, I don't want to be a drama queen, but no, I really no, go for it. We the love drama queens. in our countries. And we have a case from my colleague, which will be a plenary speaker, when she was at school, she's HIV positive. Uh, the teacher of biology told everything perfect about HIV, but in the end of the lesson she told that we should never met those people. So that's not just the reflections of needs and interests of young people in uh, like priorities or strategies, it's about education. We don't even have equal information which can be like considered as such a prevention. There is no uh, prioritizing for young people in national interest at all, not only in Ukraine but in the other countries. But I think we will soon change it. We, of course, we need the support of those who are here and the conference is a perfect opportunity for us to be heard and to be supported. So, nothing about us without us. Yeah, and just to add what Danny was saying, he says, I think this is the problem of the framing. So like, what do you say, people are not afraid of HIV anymore. That's the, that's the whole question. It's just because we don't have education and then, why build this fear? Why build this, this, this stigma? If we were, you know, to have access to comprehensive sexual education, if you link HIV to SRHR programs and you have like a broader none of like our sexuality, you know, like a gender and like get to know ourselves and like be educated about sex and our pleasure about all of this, you wouldn't be living in this need for like to fear HIV, you know, because that's a bigger that's that's the bigger issue here. That's, that's what we are advocating here for, is just to integrate these. We're more and more talking about HIV, you know, not just operating in a vacuum, it's just putting it in a, in a larger place that we can discuss um, being ourselves, being our sexuality. We are, we are a, a generation that is not afraid to talk about sex, and that's a great thing. All right, my name is Dee from Lesotho, and I will just like to add up on what they said because those were very great uh, points. Uh, 
we really need to broaden up on the information and the education on HIV because really now HIV is not really an issue and uh, I love what my my foundation ambassador said yesterday, Jay Kaiser, like how many of you guys take pills every day for a living? Needless the HIV pills, needless, but how many of you guys take pills every day? We all have those people who take vitamins every day to survive. We all have those people who have hypertension and all the stuff. And really with taking HIV medication shouldn't be a problem. And like uh, Daniel said, nothing without youth for youth. Thank you. Of course, like we agree, I agree on, on uh, what they said, but I would here like to give a perspective of person living with HIV. Everybody is taking medicine, but think about the child who is taking medicine, born with HIV, now it's 17 years, shifting from first line to second line, uh, taking all the side effects which, which, I, which I felt in my childhood, I again experienced during when I was shifted to second line. So yes, we don't have to fear for HIV, but who will feel like I am having my problems? I am taking medicine. I am alive. But who will deal with my mental problems? I have psychological problems, which is killing me every day. Though I am fortunate enough that I am able to deal all those problems with me because I am here. I am fortunate e enough to be here. But those friends in our countries who are not fortunate enough to be here or to deal with their problems, what about them? We are facing every day with psychological problems, and this is what people, uh, youth are dying because of it. If I talk about uh, youth who are in my country, they are scared because of disclosure problem. I am open with my status, but what about what about them? So it's this is HIV, which is a part of our life, and it is a concern for us, because I don't want anyone uh, who talk about me as a negative person. I would just like to share an example. Though I am born with HIV, I have not written it over here that I am born with HIV. But if I disclose my status with someone, they might think me as I am gay. They might think me that I have done something wrong. This is what I am facing now. So it's like HIV is a concern, but apart from HIV, stigma is the biggest concern over here. So though we are, I am like, I am happily living with HIV. I am happily taking medicines. But on the other part, HIV is always a concern for the people living with HIV. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. My name is Nancy Shimla, coming from Zambia, working with Awit, Young Voices. I just want to add up what my colleague has said. Uh, I think living with HIV is much easier than living with cancer. Is anybody agreeing with me? Because cancer has got so much pain in it. But with HIV, nobody can tell that you're HIV positive. I've been, with, I've been living with HIV since I was born, but nobody can tell. I've got this uh, chance to speak about my status because of, I have support from family and friends, a lot of people. But if you look at our fellow young youths out there in our countries, others are face, having mental issues to, to face. They have no support from people around them. And that's why a lot of stigma is coming from. Young people are being discriminated. I may give an example. I might go to the healthy facility and explain to the health care provider, saying, I'm facing side effects with the drugs. What do they tell me? They just say, no, hold on to it, it will go. But they, they don't know what I'm feeling inside me. And that leads to denial. People stop taking their medication. And when the youth gets back to treatment, there's treatment failure. So what we as youths and young people are lacking is support and being to uh, put first priority in the pro program of HIV. Because we are the people that feel it, and we are the people that face it. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to add on that. My name is Josephine. I think when you look at the past and where we are, that's what brings up people to think it is not yet a priority or it is not um, a primary thing. But I want to let you know that HIV is still a primary issue, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. It is still primary. If we still have people dying because of AIDS-related death, if we still have babies being born with HIV, 
if we still have people failing on medication, if we still have people that cannot access medication, then there is no way you're going to tell me that it is not primary. And if we do not think that it is not primary, then we will not even achieve the goals that we want to achieve in the future. HIV is still primary. And to go back to the second question, I'm lucky that I was born HIV positive, but then I grew up in psychosocial support groups. And that met my, my needs physically, emotionally, and psychologically. I thank God for that. that. That's incredible. I just want to touch on that really quickly because I think you guys have brought it to light. The psychosocial aspect of it is a huge part of not just living with HIV or dealing with HIV and AIDS in your community, but also adding to that the fact that you guys are going through your adolescence and entering your teenage years. So all of the pressure of being a teenager on top of your health is a lot. And so when you don't have that psychosocial aspect to a program, do you guys think it can work? Or do you think a program needs a psychosocial aspect to it? Sure. Thank you. Giving me medicine does not mean that I'm going to take it. And that has been proven. Therefore, we need another component that will bring in something to make this person take this medicine. It is not easy to take medicine on a daily basis. I take one pill in the morning. Others take five. So, and you're telling me I have to take it until the cure comes. For heaven's sake, I need something else that will make me feel like I'm family, I'm part of them, and okay, however much I have this, I can still take this medicine and move on. We need that hope, and that hope can only be gotten in family support groups or in psychosocial support groups. Uh, as my colleague has said, I myself was once under denial because I, I lacked uh, support from friends. Once friends found out that I was HIV positive, they all ran away from me. Why? Because they had no information about HIV. I would never miss an appointment to collect my medication. But I just collected and packed them home. I wasn't taking them. But once I got to have that support I really needed upon my life, I now understood saying, no matter how I may try not to take medication, the HIV still lives in me. And it's up to me to take it and live a healthy life. And one thing as HIV adolescents they need to love, not to be treated so special, as if they are different from any other human being. We're all human, one human being, and we can all achieve the same things. Nothing is special but someone who's got HIV in life. Let's check in with the audience. Do you guys agree with that? Woo. What do you think? Wow. As Oprah would say, we're having aha moments by all of you. Everybody's just feeling it. Does anybody else have something to say about that? Go for it. So as we are just talking about psychological aspects, I would like to focus one thing which I observed in India back. Uh, we, we are having a group of 100 children, those who are born with HIV. I'm not talking about who acquired after their birth, but the, but the children who are born with HIV and now are in their adolescent or young age, they feel psychologically dead, uh, their parents are the main cause of ruining their life because of they have to deal with HIV. So here this thought in mind is really serious just because uh, no one is just getting up and saying that come on give me HIV, I would love to take HIV. But this thought when a child thinks that he might be also going through suicidal tendencies, depression and other things which are not at all addressed in our program. We just think of counselling but, but we are lacking behind from quality counselling which is really necessary for a, for, a, for a youth who is living with HIV. So which we need to work on really hard for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, but the psychos psychosocial support, well, I lost my father when I was eight because of AIDS and like I'm um, this, the situa the mind situation is like it's very common for all the teenagers because uh, most of them were born in the end of the 90s and their parents were infected and they live with one or uh, without parents at all and we have the occupied territory and the, the teenagers are moving from there without parents and they were still in 2014 the programs which were supported by the Global Fund for Teenagers they are, were over and of course government didn't take the responsibilities for them so 
there, there is a very big need in so psychosocial support for teenagers right now, and if like we will not do it now, they will grow up from, like with a big, really big problems. I know that. Yeah, give him an applause. <laughs> yes, I want to quickly touch on that. Um, hi, I'm Melody. I'm the Dutch Youth Ambassador on Sexual Reproductive Health and Rise. Um, so not an expert on HIV AIDS as the rest of the panel, which I've learned a lot from already in this, uh, during our session, but also now on the panel. Um, but what I also hear, and I think to come back to your question, why maybe people are more afraid or more focused on teenage pregnancy or other issues, other barriers other than HIV uh, AIDS, is maybe because we're not using an entirely integrated approach. So when it comes to sexuality, and uh, Peter also, but different of the panel touched upon it, we need sexuality education and health promotion, but to be integrated and not being reactive. So when you're HIV positive, you'll come to a service and you'll get the services. We need to reach the people that are not positive yet. And that's if someone comes in because she's afraid of having teenage pregnancy, that's your entry to also talk about all the other elements of the broad spectrum of SRHR. So we need this holistic and positive approach of SRHR. And this is not a message to us and program implementers, but specifically actually policymakers and donors and funders to not focus on one of the specific. You can't pick and choose SRHR topics as it fits your government. It has to be a holistic approach to reach everyone. Can you tell the audience? Looks like everybody's agreeing with that. Ah, there we go. Does anybody else want to say something? Yes, go ahead. And checking of services and sexual information given to the youth, we really need to uh, implement youth giving those services to other youth. Because really, when we, we, we just come into reality, when you are a young person and you go to a health facility, you find a 15-year-old lady there, and then you come there, you brought like STIs, what are you going to say to them? So we really need to implement that because I know I face discrimination from the health facility by an old person when I went there for initiation of my ERT. So really that will help put our youth in the health facilities so that we can be more open to them. Thank you. Uh, so just to add on what my friend has already said, um, I think it's time that as program implementers, we should uh, focus on specific programs that would target their people in that way that they like. So a health center is supposed to be, or a clinic is supposed to be a space where a young person will get counseling. But then instead, if a young person goes there, as my friend has said, you find someone who is older than that person and you're afraid. You cannot talk out, you cannot be open. That's the reason why we have to be programming our programs in that special way that target their people and give them a safe space so that they can be discussing about the issues around HIV and SRHR. I'll give an example in Africa. We're working with Dago Africa that were used with the power of football to give out the message to their people. So at the same time, they play football. At the same time, they're also discussing about the issues. Same thing when it comes to the project that we're doing with Avid, Young Voices. We are discussing about these issues on, on internet, online, where you're afraid of going maybe to the clinic or the health centers because we are afraid of the people that, the way they're going to treat us that side. So I think it's time that we design the programs specifically that will target the young people in the way that the young people will like it. Yeah, I, I want to echo what everyone's saying. I think we're all touching on it like so beautifully. I think you know, HIV and, and any issue in particular, if you're approaching it, um, it's more than HIV. It's more than just about HIV. It's about our lives. So you need to touch on these other intersections of our lives. And like um, you know, my friend on the panel was saying that um, that if if someone's coming in for for pregnancy or abortion, it's an entry point. And so we need to find what these other entry points are. And in particular, you know. But um, Dee also just said is, is we need peer-based support, we need faith-based support, we need sexual support, we need financial support, we need interpersonal support for dating and relationships. Um, it's, it's about all, it's our, we need a holistic approach is, is what, what I'm getting. And, and it's, all, it's the only way we're really going to fight HIV because there's no single issue. As, to quote Audrey Lord, we don't, there's no single issue because we don't live single issue lives. 
I want to touch on that a little bit because I, I agree so much with you guys. I think that there are so many drivers when it comes to HIV, and you can't just look at HIV and compartmentalize it. You have to be able to have a holistic approach to it. The one thing that I find uh, sometimes a struggle, and I, it's hard for me to wrap my head around sometimes, is uh, this idea, this fear, this taboo of talking about sex with kids when we work in youth programs. And we know that sex is one of the biggest modes of becoming HIV positive. So how do you address, address something like that when a lot of communities are, they just think that's a can of worms that shouldn't be open. Teenagers and sex should not be talked about. Okay, um, even if parents or any uh, elder person don't talk about sex with the young people, but the fact that you should know that young people are indulging in sex, no matter how far you try to hide it, they're still indulging themselves in sex. So the best that we can do is talk, talk to them about sex. Talk to them about safer sex. Talk to them about condom use. And also talk to them, you know, we're all human beings. We've born with those, that sexual feeling in our bodies. And there's no way we can deny it. So the best way is have youth-friendly spaces for young people so that they feel free to talk about sex to themselves. And also have a young adolescent peer that is also there to educate them about sexual feelings, how to keep themselves safe. So, of course, I agree with what my friend said, but uh, here the sexual education with kids should be included in school, in the curriculums, but not only for children, also for parents, that what will be the benefits of sexual education when it is given to a child and what are the risks if a child is not aware about the sexual education and how we can prevent our child from uh, keeping away from risk. If parents will be understanding the benefits of this initiative, then I hope in India the culture might change because of course in India it's a big taboo talking about sex, uh, talking about, uh, if, if we talk about the, the existing services of HIV or if we talk about uh, consent of uh, children, so it should be 18. So if I'm 16 years old and I want to have sex, I cannot go and buy a condom. If I am 16 years old and if I want to uh, access services of HIV, I should take my parents. So, of course, I am not going to take my parents to the medical, to, uh, to the pharmacy to buy a condom or neither to the uh, HIV testing center to test myself because I always experience into closed doors and no one is looking for them. So, we should our children as well as parents at the same time. Thank you. I think, um, I mean, what we heard, those are very good interventions to, like you said, a school-based approach, but also addressing parents, what is often, I think, not the first thing that we do, we start with the children. But I think we need very parallel kind of interventions going on. So you need to address the children, you need to address the parents when they don't go home and be judged because they raise questions back home. Also the teachers, but also I think the main important thing is to make sure that the people that are not now on board on and think that sexual education might promote sex to make them aware of how it actually promotes uh, low risk behavior, people to young people to negotiate their own barriers and to take respond, uh, choices that are better for them. We need to make sure that they understand that, so the parents and the teachers and the government people, because at, at all it does result in the things that they want the same. So in my position I had the honor to travel to different countries where I could speak to young people but also policy maker organizations and also people that are uh, opposing to uh, comprehensive sexuality education. But when you can show them some researches, as we had in the Netherlands, where we can see well, we, when we implemented comprehensive sexuality education in schools, the uh, age of young people starting with sex went up, teenage pregnancy went down, HIV went down. So we can actually show that the results that they also want to get to, one of the main, main manners, and I believe that's the only manner, is to talk about them in a positive way, not only about what Bruna just mentioned before, not only about the risks and STIs and teenage pregnancy, but about pleasure, barriers, how do you 
ask someone out on a date? How do you go for a relationship? How do you break up? So by doing positive health promotion, but we have to start while well, we integrate that to convince people why that's needed and why that's not promoting risky, safe uh, sexual behavior. I have, I have a story about, well, teenagers have provided a training, peer trainings on HIV and some of SDAs in schools. And I remember the, I went to the class uh, where the classmates were like 15 or 16 years old and I just showed them this, the condom, and they were laughing naturally for 20 minutes. That's not funny. That's not funny because in the, in the end of the training, they were taking the condoms and saying, oh, come on, man, we will have a lot of parties in the summer. Come on, take more and more. And I understand if I did, did not give them the condom, they would have whatever it is, like STIs, HIV, and unexpected pregnancy, and so on. The thing is, uh, we can't convince our people. The thing is, uh, in the Soviet Union, there was no sex. And neither parents, neither teachers, they never use word sex at all, even on the national level. The uh, Ministry of Education, when we propose them to like, let's do something on sexual education, they don't use uh, the word sex at all. They use only reproductive or something. So there is no sexual education at all, and that's a big problem because we have a growing epidemic of syphilis, of HIV, and the uh, statistics of uh, pregnancies in 16 years old are shocking. Uh, so something like that, but we need to change it and we already have some changes. We created the online course which is popular for teenagers and it is, like you said, that, that was very important. It is in a positive key. It's, it's saying about the pleasure, the gender, rights, and self, like, so self, you know what I mean, so. Yeah, I was gonna actually ask about that. How do you, do you guys feel that the sex education is diverse enough or does it just, tend to be heterosexual relationship sex or do you feel like the education part of sex education covers the variety of relationships that young people might find themselves in? Well, Zach, you're shaking your head. <laughs> yeah, um, in the United States, absolutely not. Yeah, there's, there's only 13 states in the United States that require sexual education be scientifically and medically accurate. So there's two-thirds of the states, who, who knows what's going on. Um, most of it's abstinence-based, um, which, you know, the U.S. in particular has a problem in the U.S. South. Um, and if you look at a map, I've, se I've seen, like, heat maps of, like, where the HIV epidemic is concentrated, mostly in big cities in the U.S. South. I've also seen a heat map of where abstinence-based only education is implemented, and it's mostly in the U.S. South. And it's like, that's not a coincidence. Um, there's not... There's, there's not enough representation in, in sexual, sexual health education across, and I'm speaking from, as a US representative, I guess, but, but even in Southern California, um, you know, I was going through health class and I'm like this, you know, closeted kid and my health class was like six weeks during the summer and everyone just, we wanted the grade, we wanted to get an A. And so we were all copying answers out of the back of the book. I didn't learn anything. So when my first partner told me I had HIV, I was scared shitless. I was like, what, what does that mean? I have no idea. Like, I, I had to go, luckily I had um, a, a primary uh, provider who was so um, empathetic and, and also queer, like randomly, and like gave me the reassurance that I was gonna be fine, and I know that's not everyone's experience. It was, it was a very privileged experience. Um, but, and I'm sorry, I don't wanna take up too much space, but. But yeah, no, it's, it's, there's not enough going on for comprehensive sex ed in the United States and around the world. We need, we need it to be more robust. We need it to be more inclusive of sexuality. We need to be empathy-fueled, um, uh, sexually pleasure-focused. Like, we need it to be pleasure-focused as well. We want to learn about our bodies and what works for us and what doesn't, and we need to have the interpersonal uh, components. That way we can know about dating and relationships and how to break up and, and do all those things. It's, we, we need the wraparound services. Otherwise, we're not going to see a decrease in HIV infections. So, let me answer a little bit. Because, like, I think the key to achieve this is really to invest in peer-to-peer -peer education because we can easily uh, talk about sex, safer sex, well-being and self-confidence on eye level. And, like, always when it comes to sex education, it depends on the teacher. So, 
besides the curriculum and like the policy making, what, what does the teacher and what does the teacher believe in? So um, we at Youth Against AIDS, we provide peer-to-peer -peer education and we really get the feeling that it's a valuable add-on to, to people, to young people, because they can express themselves in the way they are, they can ask their questions, and this is like not a HIV-focused question, it's like a general, it's a general question in terms of sexuality, first time having sex and all these things, so it's very important to be relevant for them and to provide relevant information. Um, so, yeah, I totally agree with Bruna, so we do need a universal coverage of sexual health and well-being in general. I just want to quickly check in with the audience. Do you guys agree with that? Where, where do you land on that? Yeah? All right, continue. Oh, look who's joining us. In my opinion, uh, in Africa, especially in African society, still you want enough education concerned about the sexual issues because many African peoples, they didn't have an experience concerned about the sexual issues. Medias, maybe mass medias and other sources it may help us in our societies, especially in Africa. Yeah, go for it. So, tapping to all of that and then going back to meaningful youth participation, too, I think that we talked about intersectionality, but also not that it's not tolerance, I don't like this word, it's about diversity and, and meaningful inclusion in the sense that just Briefly, I'm a feminist, and not only in my activist, but also in my scholarship. So feminist scholarship tells us that we have, um, we have to understand our positionality and our epistemology. So we have to come, from, we are here in a place that we are all privileged, so we have to come here in a place that we understand those who have been invisibilized, and voices that for centuries have been, you know, like long gone. So uh, when we're talking about all of that in sex ed, and including you, you know, like in political spaces, decision making and all of that, we have to make sure that it's not racist, it's not, you know, um, there's no discrimination to any queer because even like the LGBTQ movement, when you put pe people in so many boxes and letters, you're not, you're just limit, like just limiting all the spectrum of queerness and everything that it's there. So the thing of, so, so, so the approach here and the importance of peer-to-peer -peer service and approach of this cycle, you know, like and support groups of youth, it's basically that because we understand each other. So it's just it's just the face of not having, you know, like white men in suits dictating us because they're, they're not come from this. So that's basically just it's just having like meaningful inclusion, participation, but diversity also not leaving anyone behind. I want to just really quickly uh, include, since we have a live Twitter feed here, well, I, I've noticed you guys have been looking back, and I'm just wondering, have you seen anything up there that uh, has sparked something for you, uh, conversation-wise? Yeah. I saw a question, it was a while ago, what are, uh, some also asked to the other ones, what are kind of the success stories of meeting uh, NYP in, in, uh, when it comes to HIV, and what are stories that we think like, Maybe not do that if you want to have Yeah, I definitely want to know that because I think we don't ask you guys enough. What should we stop doing? <laughs> if I can say one example myself, and uh, you already said a bit, a bit about uh, teenagers, for example, what we heard now peer to peer, and we heard different opinions about what youth friendly service is, but to just make sure that we are just talking about our own references and the people we spoke to, but I, I can represent for all young people, especially as you said, we, you have always these different boxes, but then you have the young people. But we take all those other boxes as well to make sure that if you are making services for young people, consult those young people and ask them what youth friendly is to them, not only to us as a panel or to um, one of the success stories that you've heard in another country or another region, but to make sure that you consult your own young people to make sure it's youth friendly. Uh, and I think the things that we've seen, teenagers uses use as media for advocacy, um, and engage with young people in that you have a tie in Ethiopia where they, uh, they actually have a review panel within the Ministry of Health and they can review policies made by the government exactly what you said, not only to have an advisory role but to actually have decision-making power. 
Uh, and my position itself is advocated for by the Dutch led NGO Choice for Youth Sexuality that mobilizes young people with tools and, and uh, mobilize them in the international advocacy places, but also develop different tools on how do you engage young people meaningfully. And the call to action that Bruna said is actually based on those principles of call to flower and participation. Come talk to me if you want to know more about that. I won't take too much space now. But those are examples that I can share of actual meaningful year participation. Thank you. So, uh, the call for action for me is like simple. I said that we were fighting for like two years to get for, uh, to the national level in Ukraine. And we actually did a lot and coming back to a course of sexual, we will also fight soon with the conservatives, with those who deny HIV and so on to implement it in schools. And this is my call to action, uh, that teenagers, if you all can hear me, teenagers are ready to fight for their rights, teenagers are ready to engage and we want you to engage us. And like we brought here with Amsterdam Youth Force together, we, we really did a lot here. My, a lot of my colleagues from Ukraine, it's the first time in history when, for example, uh, young colleagues sitting in the national in the coordinating committee of this conference, and I, we brought here Ukrainian volunteers, uh, a big one to do. So, and, thank you. And I think the, all the Ukrainian delegation, we would like to, uh, we would like to share that we are happy to be here. And Charlize, we would like to invite you to Ukraine. Will you come to us there? You don't need to twist my arm. Right. Yeah, I'll be there, sure. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, no, I'll just oh, oh yes. sorry. Thank yes, you. Go ahead. So, like, if we are talking about inclusion of youth, of course, people who. Like, I would be shift a little bit just because uh, we should first think that our voices should be heard and each and every person, each and every youth who is struggling with their life to build their capacity should be taken into account. So if I'm talking about India, there are lots of youth who are struggling with um, talking with me as an individual that of course I am living with a check, I am there to uh, listen to him but he is afraid of talking with me just because he will think that his status might be open. So, of course, like there are really good initiatives which we are talking about, but how we indulge those youth into our program, how we take and how we bring them in with us so that they can, you know, empower themselves, they can talk about their problems. So here look, we are lacking behind. Those who are left behind are always left behind because they are not that strong enough that we are. So we should think about who are left behind, who are not able to bring them up and how we can bring them up them up is the main challenge uh, which we should think further for youth as we are into international AIDS conference and uh, uh, I guess if we if they are with us in future then that will be a success thank you yeah totally I, um, I want to take a quick moment because we asked uh, our youth panelists uh, if there was any key um, key leaders in the HIV world that they would like to hear from, and somebody that um, kept being mentioned, uh, and we're very happy to be joined by, is Ambassador Deborah Burks. And I know she's here in the audience today. She's US Global AIDS Coordinator and US Special Representative for Global Health Diplomacy. And Deborah, thank you for being here with us today. Where are you? You're here. There you are. I'm with the young people. <laughs> Hi. Let me sit here with them for a moment. <laughs> So what's your, what are you feeling down there? Are you, are you feeling a certain energy? Well, I really appreciate how clearly you articulated how you wanted to be involved in the planning at the political level and at the local level, how you wanted to be involved in the implementation in the peer-peer outreach and work. And then you wanted to be involved in the really evaluating and giving us feedback on what was working and what was not working. And I heard a really great example um, about Ethiopia and the Netherlands and how they really engaged youth representatives at the highest political level. I think we're, what I'm really interested in is how about the local level? Do you have examples that what we could do better at the local community level and who we should be engaging with to ensure your voices are heard? Because sometimes we are a bit of a distance. I had a 
great week this week so far because we got to meet with our DREAMS recipients and our DREAMS ambassadors, and that stands for Determined, Resilient, Empowered, AIDS-Free, Mentored, and Safe Young Women so that you can remain HIV-free and it's comprehensive. But they have some great suggestions of stuff I have to change right now, which we will go back and work on. But how does that become not one-offs, but something that we can constantly be engaging in at the local level? Yeah, who wants to take that? So more on a local level. Okay, like you say, saying, who should you be approaching? I think we are the people that we need to be approached because we are the people on the ground. We are the people that see and see what's happening. Because if you leave us behind and approach higher people, uh, people that are higher than us, they don't know what we feel. They don't know what's happening on the, on the ground. So for them, they'll just say, we're going for this, and I'm sure this will work for the adolescents or youths. But they're not sure. Because some of the things, we usually go against too. Because they don't work for us. We as youths, we as adolescents, we really know and feel what we really need in our lives. This is your time. You can have a conversation with everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, asking the question that how we can work more over local level. Um, and like I would like to say that first of all we need to invest more in youth uh, centric approach. So, so just now if I talk about example in India there is no at all initiative or there is no at all such youth centric approach focusing only on youth you know which can uh, encounter youth which are like me as well as youth who are at the grassroots level. So if we need to touch the ground we need to first like show a youth centric approach which is really important nowadays because we are driving the epidemic and like India is having uh, adolescent of more than more than uh, four five million so like it is really difficult to uh, to be there in the ground but uh, we need more support not only uh, support for uh, money but also there are other supports which can uh, empower youth at a grassroots level and we can be, which we can bring them up I just want to quote what my friend has said here. I think um, if you are designing programs for the young people, I'll say it again, it's very, very important that you approach us as the young people. We don't want that situation that you are designing maybe messages for us and then you are talking about condom use or maybe you are talking about abstainers. Why we want more than to abstainers. So you should approach us, hear from us what we want, what information we want. So approach us and uh, get us involved, then we give you right information for us to be involved in the programming. So you end up maybe saying, uh, as the others, we don't want our young people to have sex before marriage, but then on the ground you're having sex. So honestly, if you say, uh, let's, tell, let's tell them to be abstaining, and then we want messages more than abstainers, what to be talking about condoms, what to be talking about safe sex. So I think it's very, very important that the local level we should involve us as the young people, we should approach us and we should give you the right information. Um, maybe to, it's very pragmatic and practical to say key the way that because there are also some some tweets. One, if you were a doctor, what is the first thing you would do? One said, if you were at a government, what is the first thing you would do? I would say, if you're a local program implementer or program developer, bringing a few of your youths, if you're youth serving, bring in some of the young people as a panel, give them a relevant information, capacity building if needed, and then ask them the exact same question and you'll be surprised what you'll hear. And that's youth friendly, that's youth engaging. And then ask them if they want to be exactly what you said, in a directory, in a review, advisory. Make them a part of it, not only being youth serving, but make it a youth adult partnership or a youth led organization so that you're sure that they are engaged and they are served the way that they want to be. Um, thank you for your question. Um, I think we all have a good Give you know, plenty of examples of local level, but I would like to invite you to come to the youth village and meet all of us because we are all come from led, you know, like youth led organizations, and we came here with little to non funding, and we're still succeeding. And we are the examples of how we're succeeding, and we are competing here. So if you come to the youth village, then to the youth force of all of our partners have worked so hard to build it. That is a huge space, it's the largest youth mobilization here. So talking about what we need in the future or you know like in the field of participation is just, we got this space here now and we're, we need from you guys to not you know push us back. 
So it's just to enlarge and like make it bigger and give us more because we are doing this already. We are the ones who know, we are the ones giving the support systems when you know like when the system is failing us. So just keep, you know, making the room bigger because we're not going anywhere. So please come and have a conversation. Wow. 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 Well, if you didn't hear that, then you don't have ears or you don't know how they work because you just summed everything up so beautifully. And I wish we could sit here and talk for another hour. But time flies when you're actually talking about things that are interesting from voices and hearts that know them better than ever, anybody else. So I want to thank this incredible youth panelists, or each and every single one of them. I want to thank the youth and the audience who came out here today to support them. Um, I want to say uh, I hope that all of us will actually step up and proactively start supporting these youth organizations, these youth activists. And I really hope that we have more opportunities where people like you can come and sit at the table and actually make the decisions, be at the policy level. Yeah, I see you snapping. So th this is obviously a conversation that you could never have in one hour. So we're gonna continue this conversation and I want to bring out my friend Quinn because he's going to tell us how we're going to continue this conversation. And I, I beg of all of you to not stop this conversation. Please talk about the importance of youth when it comes to HIV and AIDS prevention. That was awesome. I know, that, right? That was so awesome. I know. I mean, I was back there taking notes. Um, I actually thank you, and thank you everybody that has been here this afternoon. Um, that was really exciting. Um, so uh, there are steps, obviously, as we've chatted through, that every one of us here today and watching live can take to increase meaningful youth participation. Uh, today was a great example of that, but we've got to make sure to not only listen, because it doesn't end here, it starts here, we have to act on what we've heard, and we have to work with the people that are saying it. Um, so, we need to work to create and sustain systems that include youth and that serve youth. So let's commit to institutionalizing these systems, and above all, Let's again make sure that we listen and we act and we work with people that are the next generation. And for everybody that's already sitting here and that has already grabbed their seat, that is so awesome, hold on to it. And for those of you out there, make sure to keep doing the work you're doing and grab your seat at the table, make the room bigger if you have to, and um, make sure to stay involved.